All right, hello everyone, and welcome to session three of Star Trek and Gut. If you're tuning in for the first time, uh, we're a TOS era game aboard a Constitution refit past the movies and uh, pretty much into that almost lost era style game, but not quite. Uh, really, uh, I don't really have much in the way of the announcements other than if you want to play catch up, uh, the first two sessions are on YouTube and you can catch pretty much all my shows on YouTube. So if you're interested, just go to YouTube. But uh, let's just go around. Let's do introductions and then we'll uh, dive right into things. So let's start with the captain. Hello, my name is Gerardo, and I'm playing Captain Caetano Deca, yet again. Hello, uh, I go by the name of Drone, and I'm playing Commander Sovak. Next would be Slaw. Uh, my name is Deca, and I'm playing Chief Engineer Slaw. I am Ben, I am playing uh, Lieutenant Junior Grade Thicanner, Security Officer. All right. So we had a bit of a technical snafu earlier today with the intro, so I'm not even going to try to run it this session. So just imagine p shiny pictures of a Constitution refit flying by your screen right now. Uh, but we're actually just going to jump right into things. Uh, I believe, Silvok, uh, you have an opening log. And while you do that, I'm going to get our science officer in here. Cool. Good thing I wrote 15 paragraphs. <laughs> So, First Officer's Log, Stardate 30011.4. As First Officer, it is my duty to periodically remark on the state and performance of the Gangut and her crew. After our first successful mission, I can report that ship and crew are settling into their roles adequately. The crew performed satisfactorily during the mission to the Saurian colony planet of Rikyu, and were instrumental in resolving a crisis threatening the planet's civilian population. Though not a Federation world, Governor Tarumshe expressed her gratitude for coming to the planet's aid and in exposing a case of high-level corruption in the planetary defense force involving the illicit sale of the component trilithium. It is still early days, as my human colleagues might say. However, I remain cautiously optimistic that this crew, with all of its eccentricities, will continue to demonstrate their competence in the mission ahead. We are currently approaching the star system FJC20903. A long-range probe has detected radio signals coming from a moon of the star's second planet. It would seem that the moon harbors a pre-warp civilization at the same approximate level of development as Earth's late 20th century. There is currently no indication that the Gangut will be detected, so we have been granted permission to passively study this civilization. All righty. So real quick, let's go ahead and uh, settle up webcams, and then we'll uh, switch for the first scene. So everybody but the captain, you know the drill. All right, and then Mr. Sovak, Mr. Talcath, Ms. Again, Sloan. I'd like to apologize uh, for being late. Uh, You're fine. My mom had some last-minute issues. Yeah, it's all right. And then uh, Mr. Thakanner. All right, so I still have to do a little bit of adjustment, but that's my end. But let's get you guys into the role play. So uh, we're going to cut to the bridge where outside on the view screen, all of you who are present on the bridge at the moment, uh, let's say Slaw's there for some reason or another. That way uh, we get you in on the scene as well. Say so you're over at this station. Uh, but on the view screen outside is a blue-white gas giant. Um, it's about the size of Jupiter, and you guys are on the opposite side of the planet from the warp capable or the pre warp um, moon that was mentioned in the opening log. Um, you ha don't really know the designation of, like, the local designation of either the planet or the moon with the civilization on it, and you're still in the very early sort of stages of setting up your anthropological studies if that makes any sense uh so why don't we start there let you guys role play and it'll give me a little bit of time to fix webcams sorry well, i thought you were Stop going for immersion i'm like oh he's got he's got a shipboard <laughs> announcement <laughs> i'm gonna 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 work on that i'm gonna work on that so, uh, uh, Talcath, we, yes, we are, 
do you have any any ideas how long we still have to stay here to scan the civilization? It bothers me being so close to uh, people and not be able to interact with them. Let's say with the density of, of the day that's coming in, probably maybe a couple more hours. Yeah. Yeah, it'll probably take a couple more hours. Unless unless you desire to do to be up close and personal and do this away. And do this on a away team. Yeah, well, well, I would be glad to have the opportunity to study, to study a completely new culture and its political systems. I gotta be honest. And yes, I'm sorry, Talcath, but I'm not really comfortable with this. He'll, so, he'll be done. He'll be done shortly. Um, maybe, maybe I can. Maybe you can vouch some extra power. Design systems, I can be maybe that'll help speed along the process. Hmm. Any input, Lieutenant Fig? Well, uh, I'm thinking uh, we could maybe divert a bit of power, but we're still running some repairs, repairing some equip equipment. So, um, not too much power, please. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Fig. Yes, please divert whatever power you can you can get. But remember that repairs are essential, but the ship needs to be up and running. Understood, Captain. Speaking of, I find the uh, political system of this planet quite interesting, How and I chuckle for a bit, and I kind of just scroll away at a data pad. Kaitano looking very puzzled. How come? You mean, okay, so maybe just me being, this is maybe just me being not open-minded, but I find a lot of the, let's say, um, a lot of the planets and political system of this era, generally in the whole universe, are a bit too dogmatic for my taste. It's like people don't even want to argue. And when they do argue, it's like they're not even arguing what they're saying they're arguing. They're arguing something completely different. Yes. That is a uniquely Tellarite observation, Lieutenant. Well, I mean, uh, I think, I'm not gonna say our system is better, but it has some advantages. More time to develop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna stand by and let you tear down this culture that we don't even met, we never even met to shreds just because you're uncomfortable with the situation. No, 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 I'm not uncomfortable. I'm just saying that they could handle some, I mean, no, actually, I'm not going to go into it. Let's, uh, let's, let's keep studying them. I'm sure we'll find something uh, interesting. Of course, of course. Please keep in mind that they don't have as much time as we did to develop their systems and their political and juridical structures. So, while it might seem outdated and I want to say old fashioned to you, they think they are on the crisp of the wave and we cannot, and I repeat, we cannot break that assumption. Of course, Captain. Of course. And on that note, Mr. Talkath, I'd like you to roll me a reason science difficulty of zero okay. and if someone can grab the ship sensors science and remember the ship always has a focus and only rolls one die uh i forgot I did, we it. did we didn't maintain any momentum did we no the momentum resets every single session unless we're doing like a two-parter okay so oh 
And I get my determination back. Yeah, you. everybody does get their determination back, so that's the other benefit. Uh, would computer focus help in this at all? Yeah, I'll give it to you. Okay. Let me roll is sensors and science. Science. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, good start. There's already two successes on the board. So two momentum then, I assume? Uh, three momentum, because the gang group got you an assist as well. So yeah, three momentum. So, uh, you know, maybe a little bit motivated by the captain to speed up scans. You maybe shun a little bit of power into the sensors and take a closer look, as it were. So as you do, uh, I'm going to go over some general facts. And just remember that as science officer, you do get a free question. All right. So first things first, of course, you have the blue-white gas giant, roughly about the size of Jupiter. And it's roughly in the star's habitable zone, which means that instead of like having the ammonia clouds of Jupiter, it actually has liquid water clouds. Then that's where the white is coming from on the planet. Um, what you're seeing is that there is a radiation belt uh, that's donut shaped that surrounds the gas giant. And the belt isn't really a danger to your ship. But to a less advanced vessel, it might have some problems. Um, and that's sort of where the moons come into play. Um, one of the moons, a large moon, is a class-Y demon planet, or a class-Y demon moon, I should say. Um, lots of um, volcanic activity, some toxic atmosphere, and generally not a place you want to visit. Uh, but while you're here is the third largest moon, uh, that is known as Jindar, or at, la at least that's the name the computer has given you. Um, it's a Class M world, and it maybe has an orbit of about five days around the gas giant um, that basically takes it outside the radiation belt. Um, it's not unlike the magnetic field that the Earth has that protects it from the radiation belt, if I'm making any sense. Okay. Um but that's what you get with your scan. Now, again, you do have a free question. Hmm. Okay, so this one, so this is not going to affect our ship, not even if we stay in prolonged amounts of time. I would say that if you were to spend a, a prolonged period of time with your shields or your um, navigational deflector down, then there would be a problem. But as long as those are two functioning systems, Stay here as long as you want, really. Okay. All right. And then, and so I wasn't able to get enough processing power to at least get this, to get the data collection done to what the cat, captain would like, right? Uh, I would say no, but you could spend two momentum and we could change that because that is uh, basically spending two momentum to create an advantage. Sure. Let's do that. Okay. So I'll give you a little bit more information. So the planet you're seeing, the habitable planet, it's or moon, I should say, it's very odd. You're getting two distinct life form readings. There seems to be at least two distinct species that exist on the moon. And you are picking up some rudimentary radio traffic, but what really catches your attention is that there is a small metallic object that is skirting the gas giant's outer atmosphere. And as you sort of hone in on that object, like, what, what is this object kind of a thing? What you see, and maybe you even bring it up on the view screen, what you see is a small, primitive space capsule. And you don't know its purpose, you just know that it's skimming the atmosphere right now. Um, if I were to try and give you a visual description, imagine almost like a, a sphere with a bunch of antenna and uh, other sort of um, thruster arrays just sort of haphazardly or seemingly haphazardly sort of jutting out from surfaces in the sphere. Hmm. Captain, uh, could we activate tractor beam? There's a, there's a small space capsule out there that seems to have caught, caught our eye. Or at least cut my eye out there. Uh, does it look like alien technology? Anything we recognize? Uh, that is a question for that is a question for ELH. 
You've never seen this before, but what I would say is that part of your scan would reveal there is a life form aboard. And that Cap life form does match one of the species on the moon. Captain, we do not, I do not recognize this, but it does look similar to the species that is on the moon. So the species, this might be their first attempt at space travel. Maybe we should bring them, well, okay, here's a question then. Actually, shoot, I don't know if I can ask this. Is, if we were to bring this, if we were to bring this on board, would we be violating prime directive? Yes. Um, so if you were to bring that capsule aboard just straight up, you would definitely be breaking the prime directive. Can we get any kind of like more detailed scans? Slaw, why don't you roll me a reason engineering difficulty of one? Mm. All right, two successes means you get a point of momentum. So, you know, Slaw, you're looking at this uh, thing on the on the uh, sensor read, and something's off. Like, it's primitive, yes, but it's almost like they... I'm going to use an analogy here. It's almost like the difference between, like, a nice Porsche and a Mad Max vehicle, if you understand that reference. Mm. And That's it's one of those things where the Mad Max one, yeah, the Mad Max one is what you're seeing. Um, but it's it's almost deliberate, like it's almost like someone deliberately didn't do certain things, like certain safety features that would be commonplace. You would think, um, but what you also notice is that the orbit is decaying of the vessel in that its scraping of the atmosphere is slowing it down and it is having some difficulty maintaining its course. Hmm. Well, I turn to the captain and I kind of give, well, uh, this seems to be some sort of, well, if you allow me to use the word, um, shabby kind of, I, I don't entirely understand what it's intended for. It seems to just be on purpose built with lacking certain features just kind of hanging around being slowly decaying in the atmosphere quite strange this does, does the the technology from the object match the technology on the on the moon no this seems to be in perhaps intentionally worse as if it was either intended to be bad or perhaps it's an older construction mm -hmm. lieutenant does the the ship have any sort of radio contact with the surface and i address that to any of the various lieutenants in the room yeah. right right, right. <laughs> uh let me uh actually move you to this map which i meant to do earlier because this gives us sort of a visual all right so of course you've got the gang good uh outside the gas giant and apparently i didn't save my moon so i'm just gonna freehand them here all right so you're here and well it would also help if i drew on the right layer uh-huh all right. So, uh, all right, so you're over here to the left. The habitable moon is on the other side of the gas giant right now. So you can't actually get a direct scan. The scan you did earlier will say you bounced off a probe, um, mm -hmm. but you're, you don't have a direct line of contact to the moon, the habitable moon right now, which means the little object, the little probe or whatever the hell it is, um, also does not have contact with the Class M moon. Hmm. So I relay that to the captain. I tell him, well, it seems like this probe is now completely, well, not at least currently maintaining radio contact with the moon. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this means that this would be a 
good opportunity to perhaps interact with this future. But Probably. what happens when he, he come and they come back? Here's the Here's the issue. If we interact with that life form, we will be considered violating Prime Directive. Yeah, for the moment, we should perhaps only watch, <laughs> observe. But the thing that's, that, that intrigues me is why is this so poorly built? Let's put it like this. Because for, for a pre-warp, for a pre-warp civilization, attempts at space exploration are usually luxurious and cost-intensive. This looks like a, an individual. Mm. Like a... Can I make any kind of educated guesses on the, like what this probe does or is intended for? Um, I would say you could give me a momentum to get specifics, but I would tell you just in general that this is maybe just meant to be a manned probe type of thing. Hmm. Um, I, I'm curious as to, uh, what kind of knowledge we can get from, uh, like a scan of the passenger in this capsule actually like maybe some of these uh safety requirements aren't necessary due to their biology reasonable assumption but as you propose that i'm going to spend a little bit of threat because mr sovak mr thakaner you're seeing that the probe has begun transmitting not to you just Transmitting in general. Uh, Mr. Thaganer, put it on speakers. Run it through the translator. All right. Commander. So when you, uh, when you pipe it through, the following message comes through. And the speaker is a feminine voice, but it's a very gruff, almost, to make a comparison, almost Tellarite. Like, they're... They're very, you know, kind of sturdy, if that makes any sense. But they say, mm -hmm. uh, this is Interlunar Probe 12. We are in immediate distress. We are caught in Zephrel's gravity well. Our orbit is decaying into its outer atmosphere. And we are unable to generate sufficient thruster power to break free. We are in full eclipse from Jindar and are unable to contact the Master Control. If any other listener is somehow able to receive this message, please respond and advise. Repeat, this is inter Interluder Probe 12, and the message repeats. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Talkath, how long do you think it will take for, for this, this probe to, to completely fall irre irreversibly into the gravity well? Uh, by my calculations of the distance and how intense the magnitude is, say maybe a few minutes at most. What is odd to me is that this is a pre-warp civilization. Either there are more of them around this planet, or they actually have encountered other races before. Because or who... Captain, there have been eleven failed attempts to launch a successful interlunar probe. Considering they did mention this is interlunar probe twelve. Yes, but who might be hearing out there if not us? It seemed to be a general distress call, maybe just kind of reaching out into the void. Um, can we do a, uh, a, a scan to see if there are 12 or if there are 11 or more uh, probes or other 
devices are around the planet. Yeah. Why don't you roll me a reason security? And the Gengut will assist you with a sensor security. Let's make this a difficulty of two. Go ahead. Okay. Shoot. Oh. Let me see here. Um, okay. And... Is the because of the advanced sensor feeds the difficulty reverses in one, right? Well, first we have a sax solo, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes, uh, that actually does bring it down to one. Yes, all right. Well, there's an assist from the Gengut. Good start. Uh, if I can keep my sheet uh, in still long enough, uh, okay, no, no, no focuses. Hey, three successes, which means you get a point of momentum. So you sort of cast a wide net, just scanning the general area, but looking for similar metallic objects. Yeah, sure enough, there are roughly about five or six of these similar probes. But the key distinction is you're not getting life sign readings from those probes. They're of the same configuration as the one that is distress calling. But the other ones are either in the process of being crushed by the gas giant's atmosphere, or they are so far flung out into space that there is no hope of them ever returning to the gravity well kind of a thing. But again, key distinction, no life forms on those other vessels. No life forms or no life signs? Both. Okay. Um... Do we have enough time to recover one of them and see if there's any data that we can recover before the uh, before twelve uh, is in is unrecoverable? I would say normally yes, you would have about an hour's worth of time. But I'm a GM. I have threat. Nope, you got five minutes before probe one, probe twelve is no longer going to be recoverable. <laughs> And if that wasn't bad enough, they broadcast again, but Sovak, you notice this in particular, they are deliberately directing their transmission to the Gengut. Captain, we may have some circumstances arising that make this situation much more complicated. Uh, they seem to be triangulating their message towards us. Engage direct on being Stakhanor. Hold off their descent. Captain, right. might I remind you of Starfleet General Order 1? Are you saying I'm everyone to be doing this? I'm merely okay. quoting regulations, Lieutenant. Well, if I could come, if I could make a suggestion, um, perhaps we could just like pull it slightly out of the gravity well just enough to like get it out, but not actually have to, you know, maybe make a small mark as possible. Just kind of like nip them out and then leave. That was my intention, Lieutenant. And I hope, I hope they don't have advanced enough scanners. Okay. Uh, do I? Do I just do it, or do I need to make a roll? You are going to need a roll here, because uh, because the thing is so crudely constructed, if you are not careful enough, you could break apart this capsule very quickly. Could I, uh, could I set up some sort of shielding or interference around us? That way, if the probe does try to scan us for technology, we won't be in, viola we won't be in direct violation and influencing influencing this civilization yeah i would say Great you could just do that, that. Mm -hmm. all right so tall Kath, you set up that sort of dampening field the canner you're activating the tractor beam now normally this would be a control and a security difficulty of two um and this would be assisted by the ship's structure and security if i remember correctly 
Uh, let me double check. Uh, structure security. I had it right. Um, the difficulty is actually going to increase, though, because of the distance and because of the, the, ah, the nature of this probe. So it's going to be actually a difficulty of four. Is it still control security? It is still control security, and the ship is still assisting you with structure security. But you the should, difficulty is a four. You should okay. spend some momentum at least. Uh huh. Um. Yeah. All right. I would like to spend one momentum to get a third die. Okay. Okay. Got that. There we go. We're down to momentum. Okay. There's an assist from the Gengut. Gengut is on fire today. Oh. Exactly, on fire. So you have the option here of spending determination to re-roll as many dice as you want, or you can simply succeed at cost. But the succeed at cost is there will be a complication. Hmm. Uh, sorry, my dad was blowing up. You said I can either succeed at cost or what was the other one? Uh, spend your determination to reroll as many dice as you wish. Mm. So spending the determination would require a, a value. Three, it, okay. I'll do that. Okay. I will spend my determination and the value will be uh, meticulous scrutiny and pride in his work. So it'll be that I noticed that, that double checking my, uh, my attempts at uh, tracking, uh, Raining, uh, pulling the uh, the probe in, mm -hmm. uh, I realized that I was I, I hadn't compensated enough for part of the uh, uh, the planet's gravita uh, gravitational pull. Yeah, that works for me. And yeah, uh, you could reroll as many as you want, or you could just roll the one that failed. Again, it is an option to reroll all of them if you were so choosing. Okay. Um. Honestly, I'm going to say let's not make that worse. <laughs> so it's just the one die, no focus, and... Hey, look at that. There you go. That is five successes, which means you get a momentum back. So you are able to pull the probe uh, more or less out of the atmosphere and away from its deadly descent to being crushed into nothingness. However, there is a catch, even with your success. I need you to roll me three challenge die, please, to represent how much damage the probe takes because of its shoddy construction. Okay. So three challenge die, nothing else, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, dear. Oh, boy. So we now have a new problem. You've pulled it out enough that, you know, if it still had thrusters and engines you would be fine. You could just let it go and it'll go on its merry way. However, with that much damage to it, you have literally ripped off all the thruster and engine components of this probe. Mm -hmm. uh, Captain, we have a problem. What else? Uh, well, the plan was originally to just pull it out of uh, its decaying orbit and let it continue on its way. Unfortunately, the, whether it was the, uh, I, I, I put too much power into the tractor beam or the materials were just too shoddy, all of its uh, propulsion systems have been uh, removed. Uh, all of them? Doesn't seem to be anything wrong with uh, the systems inside of it, uh, but uh, externally, it 
it's not going to be moving on its own. Okay, so is it safe for now? To my understanding, just it seems like it's okay. Uh, communicate. We could attempt communication at this point, if you wish. What do we know about this planet? Like, do do they have other crafts uh, uh, on orbit? Uh, there were other crafts, but none of them were manned. Or if they were manned, they were uh, the personnel were retrieved. Are dead? No, they. Uh, there are no life forms on the uh, other crafts. No life signs, no life forms. So I suppose we could extrapolate from these kind of lifeless probes that perhaps this one probe wouldn't be saved by anyone or anything. I honestly wouldn't know. So there, there are no organic materials inside the other probes. Uh, ELH? Uh, nope, no uh, organic material. OK, yeah. So no, Captain. No, uh, no organic materials, no life signs. They could have been tests. Could also stand the reason that, that somebody have, has retrieved them uh, mm -hmm. But it's unclear to me whether this this society has the capability of retrieving um, life forms from a probe in this way. Because from 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 my understanding, we could just send off this probe, calculate a vector, a direction. We use our tractor beam to to speed it up in orbit of the gas giant and try to make it reach the moon. But still. Can they retrieve this person, if at all? And they were targeting us mm. with their communications. It would seem that whether or not the society is retrieving these people, somebody is. Uh, we may not be the first alien civilization to come across this planet or this moon. So the question still stands, has it detected us? Well, it seems like it was able to detect something in this direction. Might have been a primitive uh, uh, radar sweep. Um, the distance was uh, too far for a visual uh, uh, sighting. Yes. No, you could pull it up on the view screen. Oh, well, I meant uh, like we could. Could we presume that it was too far? from that the probe was too far from us to be oh, able to actually see us um i would say it would be difficult but you are kind of a 400 meter long object that just tractor beamed them out of the atmosphere so <laughs> they probably know you're there now well we we weren't we were directly asked for help at that point when they when the uh when the broadcast was turned in our direction. Um, at this point, I would say uh, minimizing any uh, impact we would have would probably be our best bet. Um, although finding out more would also be a good idea. And Sovak, if that wasn't bad enough news, Capsule's trying to hail you again. If, if Vulcans would like groan in annoyance, uh, Sovak totally would. <laughs> um, because being inconvenienced with the Prime Directive is is always fun for him. Um, Captain, it seems we are we're being contacted again by the probe. <sighs> put it through. I beep boop and put it through. All right. So again, same sort of gruff female voice comes through and says... Well, uh, I, I, I've heard stories about aliens abducting people, but not whatever the hell you just did. Uh, 
we we were trying to help you in some way if but what happened well uh no offense but uh it's getting kind of hot in here i think you may have ripped off more than my engines i'm sorry unless you can start explaining i am not bringing you aboard uh, am I able to get a read on his vitals at all? Yeah, Talkath, you're seeing that uh, their life signs are beginning to fluctuate, as if their life support system is on the fritz. Oh. Captain, it seems like they're having issues with life support. I don't know if... I think we could technically skirt around start f skirt around directive if we were able if we brought them aboard pre under the medical pretenses. Oh, I think Captain's the captain's video froze. is frozen. Yeah, yeah, he's frozen for me too. The captain is frozen. Uh, he's writing in Discord that his Zoom is dead. He's on his way back. Okay. Do, let's do the cameras, I guess. Uh, you know, why don't we take our break here? That way we can do the cameras uh, when everybody is back. So let me just make sure I've got everybody in the right order. All right. So, yeah, uh, we're going to take our 10 minute break here and we will return in about 10 or so minutes. Stick around stream.
coming back. All right, we're back from break a little bit early. Uh, we just had a little bit of a camera snafu, but we're good to go now. But yeah, Captain, I believe you made a decision during the break. So if you could reiterate that for the stream. <sighs> yeah, since their life support is damaged because of our attempt at rescue, we have no other choice than to bring them aboard, shuttle and all. So please, tractor beam that shadow that that probe on our cargo bay uh the canner, please assemble a security team to greet them there i will be with you can i also and... come please okay i think we might need her expertise in terms of uh the uh repairs but uh do i need to do i need to make another role for continuing to bring it in or, yeah, okay. I'll just let it happen. Yeah, please select the cargo bay that's mostly empty. And yes, Fig, let's go. Cool. Okay. Right. Nice. I'll grab cargo bay five. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I actually don't have a cargo bay. I have a shuttle bay, so we'll just pseudo theater of the mind with it being a cargo bay. I mean, it's basically I'm the same thing. It's a big open area. So uh, the canner, uh, Captain, Fig, as uh, all three of you step into cargo bay five, uh, you see one of your auxiliary shuttles just chilling there. Uh, but uh, outside, as the door opens up and the force field comes to keep the atmosphere from escaping, um, the tractor beams begin to bring in this uh, alien vessel. And now that you're seeing it up close like this, you realize that it's almost like just a metal barrel with uh, things sticking out of it. Like it is, it's really, really crude. Um, but, you know, it's brought into the bay. The tractor beams lower it to the deck plate. And it sort of goes kakunk as it settles onto the deck. And as you maybe start to pull out your tricorders, there's a loud hissing noise. And you see that the top of the barrel is attempting to open up, but it's stuck. It's, it's not opening fully. Hmm. Uh, how big is this barrel? Like, I would say it is approximately, and I'm going to get dimensions wrong here. Uh, it is about three meters tall and about two meters across. Okay. So more than enough size, more than enough space for a person to be able to stand up fully if it was needed. Mm -hmm. uh, well, a humanoid, at least, mm -hmm. based on our dimensions. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell the, uh, the security team to... Uh, to have uh, their weapons at the ready, but not uh, aggressive, just okay. more, just more prepared. Um, and I'll use my tricorder to try and scan, maybe uh, to preempt any uh, medical issues. I guess. Okay. Uh, why don't you roll me a uh, reason medicine difficulty of one? Oof. I know it's not your power stat, but I believe. Oh. <laughs> um, but it's taking the doctor. Can I, can I use uh, Starfleet protocol as a focus? Because uh, it, like, I, I believe it, it would be a protocol to uh, prepare for any uh, uh, I'll give it to you. viruses or anything like that. Yeah, you can have it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Three successes. Very nice. You get two momentum. So good news. Uh, the atmosphere is not going to be a problem. You're not detecting any diseases or viruses. That would be an issue. Um, but a different issue does crop up and you see it right about the same time as two large hands sort of reach open, uh, reach up into the crack of the hatch and force it open. And a humanoid begins to clamber out of this craft. And they do look traditionally humanoid. They have two arms. They have two legs. Uh, they have, of course, a humanish looking head. But the key distinction is that they are 
massive. Like these are, to put it in D&D terms, they're not quite giants, but they are about as big as half giants, which means you're talking three meters, three and a half meters, and the rest of them is proportioned as such. And the other thing you notice as they step out of this thing is that they had to have been crammed in there. Like they they probably took up 99% of that space. <laughs> um, but the, there's two main things you notice about them. And the first is that they are wearing a crimson red mask that trails from their ears uh, down across their face that covers it completely. And there seems to be some sort of a gas exchange there um, that you're not quite sure what's going on there, but they don't seem to be in uh, distress breathing your atmosphere. So that's good. Um, the other thing you notice is their eyes. Their eyes are a unnaturally almost sparkling pink and as they look around uh they sort of you know straighten up their uh uniform that they're wearing it's basically a crude jumpsuit uh gray in color but they straighten it out uh take a look around and uh say okay uh maybe i should have revised that statement about abducting me uh take me to your leader i am captain kaitano deca of the uss gingut who are you I am Tomalor of the planet uh, Zafrel. Well, Tomalor, very nice meeting you, and it appeared that you were in distress. And uh, she turns Not and right. almost gives the bucket a kick and says, yeah, this uh, piece of crap didn't get me very far. Uh, may I inquire, where were you heading? I was just uh, using the gas giant as an arrow breaking maneuver so that when, uh, well, when the moon that I was supposed to scan came through, that I could do a low pass over the moon and then continue back on to Zephrel. But, well. Oh, sorry. Small note. I'm mixing up my moons here. Uh, the gas giant is Zephrel. Where they came from is Jindar. I had that mixed up, sorry. Okay. Well then, uh, it appears that your mission has come to a snag when you hit the gravity well and started falling, perhaps. Yeah. That's kind of what happens when you don't really keep things up to standards. But uh, that's what the Modar do. Modar? Um, is Modar your species? Or... That's not my species. No, I'm uh, I'm what you would call a Pokai. Uh, no, the Modar are the... Um, and she rolls her eyes. The brains of the operation. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of standing in the background, kind of chuckling at all this, like softly, like. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, could I take a look over uh, Tom Lore's, uh ship it, in air quotes? Mm -hmm. What are you looking take for in particular? Uh, just looking at the general construction of it and just trying to kind of get an idea of the technology. It's not very often that we get to look at Look at a new civilization's technology this up close, away from the home planet. And, uh, yeah, I'll join him and run some scans too. Okay, so while uh, Tom Lore is talking with the captain, you know, uh, Fig and Talcath, you can go over and scan. The best equivalence I can give you is it's almost as if someone took the Apollo craft and, like, you know, like Apollo 1, 2, 3, et cetera, et cetera and made it so that someone of Tomalor's size could barely fit into it. So it's very primitive by Star Trek standards. Um, it has very crude life support, very crude thrusters, very crude computers. Um, it's really a miracle that they're standing here alive, is what I would put this. For, well, for what you managed to put together here, wasn't it's not very 
very space worthy at all. You were lucky to just see, you were lucky to not, not even be spaced out when you, when you launched. Yeah, that's what happened to uh, probes one through five, but, uh, you know, they actually didn't put a poach eye in those, so. Poach eye? Yes, that is, that is my species. Oh, and see. what happened to the others? Because none of the other probes we scanned had life signs or organic matter inside. Let's just say that part of our training, and again, they do air quotes around training, involved uh, leaving our craft behind for a rescue operation, and they roll their eyes. Not that a rescue operation was ever going to come. They freaking Modar wouldn't have rescued us even if they wanted to. What do you mean by leaving your craft behind? As in meeting the void. And they point out the, you know, outside of the now closing shuttle bay door, but you get the intention that they mean they went on a spacewalk without a suit. So what you're saying is they asked you to freeze to death. Freeze to death, suffer or suffocate to death. That, again, pointing out the, the closing door, was a more acceptable form of death than suffering. That is, well, that is obviously very debatable. Um, shoot, shoot. Okay. I was going, I was, I was going to, I was going to ask if we could help her get Remember? built up, but yeah, I just. I just remembered. I just remembered our. I just remembered uh, our directives here. Uh, Tommy Lur, have you have a race have encountered any other alien races before? Well, I mean, we always kind of knew that the Modar are different species. I mean, they they're the smaller and frailer sort of versions of the Pochai, but. Talk of alien, it's usually just a children's fable to keep people in line. You're the first real aliens that I'm aware of. Then I'm sure you will understand if I ask you to keep this matter quiet when you return to your planet. They sort of look around. I mean... I can, yeah, but already I can tell that you have quite a wealth of knowledge and technology here. Yes, but unfortunately, we have our own we have our own directives as to keeping this as to keep making sure this all stays quiet. Could I fix the shuttle or? Could the shuttle be fixed only using the kind of available materials on it? Like, would I have to use any of our technology? Right, right, right. Um, I would say you could probably manage it, Fig, but it's going to take some time. Well, it seems like I can throw your shuttle together just by the stuff I have here. I mean, it's going to take a while, but... Mm -hmm. Um, the colonel will speak up. Uh, are you guys just are, are the uh, the pochai just considered expendable by the uh, the modai or the modar do view us as um, I guess you would call us servants in a way. Basically, we do all the quote unquote dirty work that the modar don't want to deal with, which is why when um, the space program started. We were live test subjects from the beginning. I kind of look around and say, hmm, where have I heard that before? And then I throw uh, the Fekiner a look, the Connor. Mm -hmm. Very subtle. <laughs> <laughs> it's so subtle, he doesn't acknowledge it at all. <laughs> <laughs> Please, lieutenants, remember the prime directive. There are many facets we need to uphold. 
Uh, Tom Miller, I believe you will have to remain in this place while we finish the repairs on your shuttle, and then we can send you back on route to what's the name of the moon? Jindar. Thank you. To gender. And they uh, sort of look back at their craft and look back at you and say, you sure you wouldn't want to part with anything here? I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, the Modar usually treat the Pochai pretty well, but um, whatever the hell that is, and they point at the shuttle, I mean, that alone could probably raise the pochai up and make us so we aren't having to be servants any for any longer That's... unfortunately unfortunately we have our directives in this case yes that's not gonna happen to miller mm -hmm. i'm sorry if this upsets you but we have our loss and we either send you back into space as you are right now, or you wait, sit tight, wait for the repairs, and then we send you back again with the with your probe or your shuttle, your ship restored so that you can return to your planet. I get to roll me a let's do a presence command difficulty of three, and you would have a focus in diplomacy here. Yes, I do, and I'm gonna spend a momentum. Hey, four successes, which means you get a point of momentum. Tomalor sighs and says, very well, I will remain here, I guess. And they just sort of look around, not sure where to sit or stand. And Is there Captain. any equivalent of like a deck chair we could get? Like, you, like you just... <laughs> you just bring out a fold-out chair. Yeah, you could get a full out chair if you wanted to. Captain, can we provide can we provide them quarters provided that there's at least some security? That way they don't just have to just stand here and wait. At mm. least at least allow them some comfort. Yeah, let's let's try to do that, actually. Uh, but first I have a question. Uh, I have code reading. Can I ask a question regarding sure. them? So, okay, my question is, are they being truthful? Can I tell in any way? Do they have like... Um, trying to say how I want to say this. You can definitely tell that there is some bitterness every time they mention the Modar. But mm -hmm. best you can tell, they are being truthful about everything they've said so far. Okay, <clears throat> then I thank you very much, Timeler, for understanding our situation. We will try to figure out some better accommodations for you in the meantime. I gotta say, we don't have anything quite near your size, if you understand me. But I'm sure we'll think of something. And Lieutenant Fig? Yes, Captain. How long do you think these repairs will take? Do I have like an estimate? If you use their technology, quote unquote, it's going to take three days. If you use your technology, three hours. Uh, what, if, what if I were to assist with those repairs as well? Half that time. At that time. So one and a half days or one and a half hours. I thought we were talking about using our technology to rebuild it, but their materials. Right, right. That's what I mean, is that if you try to make it period appropriate, quote unquote, it's mm -hmm. going to take longer. 
Ah. Yeah. I'm guessing we'd have to like make some parts. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things where you would have to make the parts out of materials that match the probes. And then you would have to use old school like welding techniques to weld it onto the vessel. Whereas if you simply did it with your technology, you could just have, you know, what is it, duranium? I think it's duranium, like duranium just made and just slap it on there and you'd be done. <laughs> yeah, can't do well, that, unfortunately. So I turn to the captain and I say that, well, uh, it's going to take like maybe one and a half days to repair it to be, what should I say, period appropriate. But I... Uh, and while it would take like way, way shorter if we used our materials, et cetera, I would argue that it's not the best option to send this technology or material even to this home planet. Yeah, your heart is in the right place, Finn. Uh, let's proceed with our suggestion. And the Kenner, can you please, since our guests will have to we we'll have an extended stay here. We need to provide them with some comfort at least. So this means, uh, <clears throat> I'm breaking character really, really quickly. What else is there in this cargo bay? Just the shuttle. Just a shuttle and some crates. Okay. Uh, can we move that easily in some feasible way or not? Um, you could move the shuttle out. Yeah, you would just have to have a pilot hop in and take it to another cargo bay or a shuttle bay. And the cargo and the crates? You could move those as well. Load them into the shuttle? Yeah, you could load them in the shuttle. You could site-to-site -site transport them. Okay. Just making sure. And, uh, Lieutenant, let's start an effort to empty out this cargo bay and let's try to place a bed of sorts for our guest. Talkath, if you could try to, I'm not sure, but how to, uh, uh... Tommy Lur, what kind of food does your people eat? It's an odd question, but uh, this is an odd day. Uh... We like meat, meat is good. Do you have meat? Oh, we could probably synthesize some. We could probably get meat synthesized. Synthesize? We can get it brought up. Uh, lieutenants, restrict communication to a minimum. Please. Sorry. Sorry. So, Lieutenant Taukath, can you please see to the cul culinary diet of the Eating eating habits of this of our guest in the mess hall, possibly. Hey, Captain, Some are not here. Thank you. The Kenner, uh, can you please start bring a team to move this these crates by hand? I get. Uh, I send one of the. Uh one of the security officers to uh, start setting, getting that set up. Okay. <sighs> oh, and yeah, possibly Lieutenant Fig, you can take Lieutenant Nihipugal to assist you on repairing this, his shuttle. That would be excellent. Thank you, Captain. Um, do you, if you need anything, Tomiller, please warn any personnel that might be in this area. I hope you don't mind, but a security team will stay here just to ensure that nothing happens to you or to us. All right. And I guess we'll have to bear with this for a day or a day and a half. They just, yeah, they just sort of stare at you like, all right. All right, I'll get to work. 
Uh, I, I presume that like uh, a cock could be brought out and yeah, like you could, you could turn it into a very sorry looking bed, you know, sort of bedside manner type thing where it's just literally an empty cargo bay with a cot on one of the side and maybe <laughs> like a like a stand up chair of some sort. But oh, I thought we would like actually provide quarters. Oh well, that that out of character. I thought that we were providing like actual quarters, but okay. No, my understanding is you're literally just keeping them in the shuttle bay and bringing things to them. Mm-hmm. I mean, yes. we could build like a pillow fort. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like, it was just going to be crates into the shuttle. Shuttle gets moved into a different bay, and we just isolate here because that way it's it's restricted. Uh, entry and exits are monitored. Um, if there's an accident, well, oh no, they got spaced. <laughs> I mean, you're not um, um, I hope you were kidding, Lieutenant. While we that were was that, that was totally out of character. <laughs> that was totally out of character. <laughs> I would not say that because no, but you're a, you're an Andarian. <laughs> no, yeah, but it's still going to be. I'm not just gonna. I'm not gonna randomly go and just be like, oh, here's a stranger. Let's kill him. <laughs> Oh lord! All right. So only, I, uh, only if she proves to be a threat to the ship would uh, would that would those steps be taken? I, uh, so I go and start working on that that food. I guess I'm apparently I'm a cook. So mm-hmm. apparently, <laughs> uh, I go just and I start kind of like banging, like with my tools on like the shell of the <laughs> of the shuttle, and I'm kind of that's like, how they work. Oh, you know what? I'm trying to figure out how to approach this. Oh, you know what else I'll do? Mm -hmm. I'll work on that while I'm synthesizing that, while I am working on that dietary food, I also work on that killer souffle (laughs) that we we found. Oh, God, the souffle. (laughs) Oh, God, the souffle. (laughs) Roll me a control (laughs) and a Science, sure. Control science. <laughs> Difficulty of three because it's a souffle. That's I will fair. spend momentum on this. Oh God. <laughs> the incre- difficulty increases on one by each egg you put in. Oh Lord. I almost want to see pure complications here. Like <laughs> you make the all... souffle, but he's allergic to it. Actually, yeah, wait. All 20s. Spend some you know threat. If I spend wait, no, it's I had to spend three to get another D twenty, don't I? Correct. A total. I'm not. So I guess I'm just doing. I was like, I was like, if I want a fourth D twenty, you spend three momentum for that. Nope, I don't. I can't do that. All right, I'm stuck with three, three D twenties. No, obviously, I have no focus in this. So. <laughs> Astrophysics. Oh. <laughs> spend a determination. <laughs> I. I uh, I don't no. have any values that will work in this. Yeah, those. Well, actually, uh, definitely... actually, wait. No, I do. I have my one of my values is anyone in AD can be the perfect test subject. Oh God. <laughs> sure. Um... Sure. This took a tangent, but we're gonna roll with it. Sure. <laughs> yeah, you could use that determination. All right. Well, that's uh, that's already one six. You can reroll the other uh, zero oh, as well oh, if you want. Okay. Okay. I'll do. I'll do that as well. Wow. So you go from literally complication city to nailing it completely. In fact, I think that gets you what? Uh, that's three so th- three extra successes. Yeah, that's three extra successes. So you get uh, one momentum by my count. Yes. Okay. So yeah, Tallcath, you, uh, you make a killer souffle. It's very nice, very poofy, as all souffles are. And uh, when you bring it to Tomalor, Tomalor just sort of sniffs at it through her mask and goes, hmm, what do you call this? Uh, from where we're from, it's called a souffle. How do, do I eat just fingers or is there utensils? Uh, just, or? Just, just, po- uh, just use this fork, poke into it, and then just uh, you might need to remove your mask or if you have any way of eating it. Just sort of take the fork and like turn it over in their hand, observing it, and go. You take the four pronged end and put put it in, and then the other end go 
takes it so they they take food. this they take the stabby end and stab the souffle, which immediately deflates because you never stab a souffle, and oh, it just man. goes. That's... She goes. Um, I'm like I'm perfectly fine as long as it tastes good. Don't worry, it tastes it it'll, it'll taste perfectly fine. All right. That... She scoops up a sizable <laughs> thing. And uh, as she brings it towards where her mouth would be on the mask, uh, what you see is that the mask itself, um, a thin line appears where the mouth would be. And then almost like reticulating uh, metal, it folds open to reveal her mouth. And she just sort of eats, you know, takes a bite, chews it for a bit and goes, "Mm -mm, it's not half bad. Do I have to keep this a secret too? Just by the shuttle loosing it right now. (laughs) Put it this way, you're well, it's food product. You're welcome to take it away for as long as you just finish it before you don't get before you get to your home planet. Yeah, and I'm very sorry, but this is food technology. A souffle well, well, is to... food technology. <laughs> <laughs> it's I mean, consumable. It's consumable food technology. Nobody will notice. Hopefully, hopefully it, it won't kill you outright. She just takes another scoop and just I, slowly I, I, puts I, it to her I, mouth. I kind of, I kind of lean over. I kind of lean over to fig. There is chocolate in it, so we'll see how that goes. Chocolate in a souffle? What? The captain is completely disgusted <laughs> at this because he, he actually enjoys culinary arts. <laughs> he's a he's a fan of cooking, mm-hmm. and. He, he took it this personally, Talcas. I'm very sorry. I'm just <laughs> gonna I'm just gonna leave the situation and Commander Sova, can you please interact with the with our guest? Because Talcas is being unreasonable. I want the bridge. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I cannot believe you have the absolute audacity to use our replicators for this. I did not use replicators for this. I actually made this with my own two hands, believe it or not. Okay, yeah, well, I mean, that's better. <laughs> At least you didn't, like, spoil our precious technology making this bizarre contraption. <laughs> At the least moment, our guest is enjoying. The moment uh, Talcat said that there's chocolate in there, the canner just steps back. <laughs> Like, is this a security risk? <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's, an actual, it's an actual health risk for him because poison, because it's poison to uh, Andorians. Ah. I forgot about that little bit before. Yeah, I, I thought I thought I'd recalled something about that, so I had to look it back up. Yeah, right. they are allergic to chocolate. Well, uh, as the captain storms off in a huff about souffles and how his sanctity <laughs> of his kitchen has been ruined, uh, Commander Silvak, you do walk in. And you have uh, time to talk with Tomalor as uh, Talcath and Fig uh, work on the uh, pod. Mm. Oh, did we lose Savak? Oh, no, sorry. I, I just didn't hear you. What was that? Oh, uh, as the captain switches out with you, uh, Tom Lore sort of looks at you expectingly, just sort of waiting for you to start the conversation. Uh, Sobak sort of looks at the souffle that he's, I'm, I'm imagining still like in his hand or her hand uh, mm-hmm. eating it, looks at it and goes, um, very, very dryly just goes, uh, bon appetit and <laughs> raises an eyebrow. What, is, what does bon appetit mean? It's uh, from a, a dead language uh, from Earth. It it means um, enjoy your meal. They just take another bite. And... What uh, what are you? What are your? I, I noticed there's a lot of different species here. Like uh, the the captain earlier was, you know, smaller than me, but generally the same. And then that one, and she points at Fig. That one is small, and I guess feisty would be a word. And that's a bird pointing at Tall Cat. <laughs> um, and he's blue pointing at the canner. <laughs> yes, um, without giving too many details about uh, about our peoples, we uh, we are a very diverse crew from a very diverse service. 
So you work together in harmony with one another. Yes. Hmm. Sounds like exactly what we need on my planet. It took uh, our various civilizations many centuries to to come to the point where we could we could work together in this way. Um, I'm I sure see. your species will will eventually progress that way as well. To be fair, I would argue that my species is not as harmonious as the others. And Still, offense. you're not treating the bird like a servant, so. Uh, prefer avian, but sure. <laughs> All right, avian. That's a new <laughs> word. We'll roll with it. Uh, my point being that even if it took your species a long time to come to this conclusion, I don't know. I mean, this this seems pretty nice. Like in comparison, I mean, this is the sort of thing my people have wanted for years, decades. Was not the servant master situation we have right now with the Modar. Um, Sovak gets inquisitive and asks, has it always been this way uh, between the the Pokai and the Modar? Uh, for quite a while, yes. Um, basically, the history of my planet is that the Modar were viewed as, I guess you would call them soothsayers? Uh, in ancient times, they were almost like godlike figures because they could predict, uh, the coming of danger and they could find water and they could find metals underground and et cetera, et cetera. Today, we know that they simply have a magnetic sense, which allows them to do most of this, but it's so ingrained in our society that you there is no thought of changing that dynamic hmm. well there is thought but the modar usually squash it pretty quickly hmm. the kind of will pipe in here um so what were the uh uh the pochai known for i mean pochai or pochai i mean we pretty much just handle all the dirty work i think i've said before i mean we were sort of the followers of these so-called gods hmm. and yet so, you both you mentioned you both share a similar appearance correct um somewhat they are um and they they kind of look at look at fig and go eh. and they go about fig's height and they go they're maybe about that high uh, they have feathers, like him, pointing a tall calf. And uh, they've got claws instead of fingers. But yeah, otherwise they, they look like me. And it makes me look at my, look, make me look at my own digits for a second, like, um, yeah. <laughs> so, like, out of character, I guess his, like, the thing that I'm getting is that, like, the, the motor are sort of more, like, reptilian sort of ish whereas mm -hmm. the the pochai are more like mammalian i guess yes that okay. would be an apt uh apt so like no form. no outright like link between the two species basically is what correct okay so have has there ever been a modar pochai interbreeding not that i've known of the hmm. modar wouldn't sully themselves with a pochai it's just not done and you both originated on uh, on Gendar, or like, where did uh, like were you on different sections of of Gendar, or did you? I don't know. I only know a little bit of history. Hmm. What is the general opinion among the Modar about the the situation? Um, because you seem to be, if, if you, pardon my presumption, you seem to be uh, not entirely dissatisfied with the situation. You don't seem to be any sort of any exhibiting any frustration as to the state of affairs. Uh, you seem to accept it. 
Oh, just because I accept it doesn't mean I don't like it. If anything, uh, again, what you have here is quite nice. I mean, it's it's literally what we would want our society to be like. I mean, no exploitation and equal rights, and that's that's what we've always wanted. Uh, let's let's put it this way: it's not entirely perfect as to what you see here. It's not entirely perfect, but it's about as close as we can get. I'm just trying to think. Like, I would, I would sort of like to give give them the opportunity to, to ask some questions, but then invariably the questions that he would ask are, are going to be ones that we can't answer. So um, maybe I'll I'll uh, speak a little bit about why we're being so caged. So um, I'll say, uh, yes, you've, you've probably heard mentioned from the captain uh, before he took leave uh, from, from the room that um, we have our own rules in place to, to protect uh, both ourselves and people like you um, from learning things too quickly and, and damaging your, your society. And in fact, it's our, our uh, most important rule, our prime directive, as you may call it. Um, so of course you understand that we aren't. We have to be not entirely forthcoming with you in, in answering questions and letting you see too much of our ship. Well, with the knowledge that I've gotten so far, I honestly don't know if I can keep it quiet. Yeah, that is of course your prerogative. There, there's very little that we can do to convince you other or to force you otherwise. Um, however, I would demonstrate uh, through historical precedents that one advanced civilization encountering a much more, a much less advanced civilization uh, often does not end very well um, for the less advanced party. Um, there's a reason why this rule is in place. It is a protective measure. And uh, the canner, I have a very important question for you. Mm -hmm. Your security team, what are they armed with? Um, I would probably say that there's probably one with a rifle and the others with phaser phasers. And like the one with the rifle is standing for their back. Because okay. it is at that point that Tomlor sort of gets up, does a walkabout. And, you know, meanders about, you know, you don't think anything of it, but in almost a flash, uh, they grapple with one of your security officers, mm -hmm. get a hold of their phaser, and in almost a hostage-like situation, they go, yeah, I'm starting to think that I'm going to have to take this stuff by force. Did we get this this uh, person's name? Did they identify themselves? Tumalor, yes. Yeah. Tumalor. 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 Tumalor, that's right, yeah. Um, oh, great. That's a hostage situation. This is fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I would like to ask, um, since I have constantly watching, mm -hmm. uh, which is when I attempt a task to detect danger or hidden enemies, mm -hmm. um, could I have gotten... Um, a chance to do something prior to that, or is that... I will give you one action. Okay. Um... I would like to attempt... Uh... I guess the, the, be the, the best bet would be to either stun her or get her away from the security officer. So I would like to, uh, to, 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 to see her moving and to tackle her away from him. Okay. That's going to be an opposed daring and a security, please. Difficulty of one. But remember, since it is an opposed task, your goal is to roll more successes than uh, Tomalor does. Okay. Uh, I would like to spend the momentum. Okay. 
and uh, hand-to-hand -hand combat, yes? That would definitely apply. These, for the love of God, work. Wow, very nice. That is uh, four successes. Uh, so I'm going to give... Let's spend six threat here. You know what? Why not? Let's let's spend some threat here. They're going to roll four, five dice. And they only get four successes, which means you are uh, capable of tackling them. Uh, go ahead and roll your unarmed damage. Uh, I believe that for you would be five challenge die. Uh, yes. Do I just click the button next to unarmed strike? Uh, no, it would be one of the macros oh, uh, okay. that you want to roll uh, it's that way. The, uh, blink. It's the blink one for that, for the unarmed strike. So, so I, I, wait, wait, so you just said challenge dice, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you see a number and there's a blank section, that's where it is. And there's a blank colored in section. Um okay, so I'm just I just click challenge dice, put five and submit, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So here's what happens. Let's rewind back time a little bit. Uh, the canner, you see obviously Tom Lore is starting to move in an aggressive way towards this security officer and is gonna go for the pistol. Um, but you, of course, have constantly watching. So you see in that split second, almost that change in their demeanor, uh, that you go careening towards them and tackle them to the ground. However, with five damage on the challenge die, you not only tackle them to the ground, you knock them out so hard that they are unconscious and now bleeding onto the deck. Okay. Um, <laughs> what is? Cargo uh, report. Uh, do we have cuffs? You would have the equivalent thereof, yes. Okay. I'd like to put a couple cuffs on her mm -hmm. and uh, then call for uh, medical to uh, attempt to uh, keep her alive. All right. Is anyone going to tell the captain what just happened? Didn't he just call for a report, or was that out of character? I think that was out of that... character. Okay. Yeah. Why, uh, it, why does it always have to come to this? Sovak just like looks down at, <laughs> at the bleeding alien, and then looks back up at the counter, and then looks back down at the alien, <laughs> and then uh, very slowly and calmly pulls out his communicator and flips it open. <laughs> and uh, Sovak to Captain, uh, I would seem our guest um, has made a mistake and is currently bleeding on the shuttle bay floor. Why they're always so stubborn. What happened? Uh, it would seem that Tumalor attempted to grab a weapon. And uh, thankfully, Lieutenant the Canter reacted quickly, if a little overzealously. <sighs> well, at least the situation did not evolve into anything. Uh, I'm going to send the medic medical team on your on your way dr namdi okoro should probably be there in a few minutes for the time being we need to restrict this person in some way i would recommend we move her to the brig captain do you think the brig would fit she can certainly lie down within it if she can't stand up Commander, I don't like that situation. Those are not Starfleet standards for quarters, if you understand what I mean. And that's, for... that's the point, Captain. They're not quarters. <laughs> they're they're yeah. in prison. We have to we have to restrain her, Captain, unfortunately. As a compromise, Captain, uh, might I suggest that we perhaps repurpose the cargo bay um, to contain force field emitters and make a makeshift brig here. That's a better idea, Sova. I, I'd feel much more comfortable with that than just putting her into a, an undersized brig that cannot fit her comfortably for the time period that we have to keep, there, keep her there. Remember, she's not our prisoner. 
which is our guest, even if you made a mistake. Should I have Lieutenant Fig uh, pause construction on the ship and, and work on the makeshift brig? Uh, no, I can't. I, be I believe I believe Talcath can pro possibly work on that. I didn't the think fastest. the brigs would be uh, that small. I thought they were huge. They're pretty put tiny. This, put it this way: the faster we the faster we finish this, the less the less complications we're going to have here. Though we should at least have a discussion based on what though the crew should at least have a discussion on what we just gleaned from from all this. Yeah, for now, I think we need an, a completely empty cargo bay, a makeshift brig in there, and we keep Tomiller inside the makeshift brig. We need room for Fig to work, time to finish that, and we need to discuss what happens next. Understood, Captain. Right. And I'm uh, I'm actually looking at the time. Um, I'm wondering if this would be a good place to make this a two-parter, um, simply because I figure like you guys need to talk offline about where to go from here. Yeah, I think that'll probably be best at this point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, let's uh, let's call the session there. So uh, Twitch, YouTube, thank you guys so much for tuning in. You'll see these lovely people next week. Until then, live long and prosper stream. Later. <laughs>